She co-founded and is currently the editor-in-chief at Can Reporter and Canadoro magazine. And she's the program curator at PTMC. We will now welcome Laura Ramos, but let me just check if all the scenario is ready for Laura and her guests. Are we ready? So, ladies and gentlemen, with us, please welcome Laura Ramos. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, all of you, for being here today. Those who know me know very well that I don't like to speak in public. So I will try to not forget um, some things uh, that are important. I want to say a special thank you to all the team and the staff that made this event possible today. Special, my partner in crime, Fernando Bandres, that shall be around somewhere. <laughs> if it was not for Fernando, we, we wouldn't be here today um, because he, he is the one uh, in charge for pretty much everything, really. So I want to thank as well uh, to our amazing speakers and to the sponsors that made this event viable and kept us away from bankruptcy. <laughs> Thank you for believing in PTMC and we hope to see you again uh, in the near future. Uh, our PTMC family is growing. This year we didn't have uh, uh, as much people as we expected, uh, but maybe next time uh, and we are very happy to count on you sometimes, and I really believe this, less is more, and we are more than enough to do this amazing networking and keep the industry and the movement of cannabis going forward. So I must say, thank you. I must say I really feel very thankful to for these little pieces of history that we are writing together. We have been here since 2018 and I think we will keep on going because what we do, we do with passion and we love what we do and I pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that you all love what you are doing, otherwise you, you wouldn't be here today. So thank you so much uh, for being here and let me now introduce you and to say that I couldn't be happier to close the third edition of PTMC um, with this interesting debate. And I will now introduce you to the, uh, this debate. Actually, it was defined by Karl Hart. According to Karl Hart, when we talk about legalization, we shouldn't limit the discussion to cannabis. While drugs like cocaine, heroin, MDMA are a bigger problem, problem. Limiting the discussion of adult legalization to cannabis perpetuates misguided notions about cannabis exceptionalism relative to other psychoactive substances. So this debate will open the discussion to new paradigms. Drug reform advocates can no longer um, elevate one sought after drug while neglecting others. So to discuss the future of drug reforms, how to regulate the substance use in the 21st century, I am very honored and happy to call Professor Carl Hart from the Columbia University in the New York City. So Carl Hart, Okay, Carl Hart is the ZIF Professor of Psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at the Columbia University in New York. And he is also a research scientist at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Professor Hart is one of the world's prominent experts on of the effects of so-called recreational drugs on the human mind and body. Thank you, Carl, for being here with us today. And now I'm happy to introduce you to Teresa Sumaviel. She is the principal investigator and research coordinator <laughs> at the I3S Institute. Thank you, Teresa. 
Uh, she's adding the Addiction Biology Research Group. Her research is focused on a better understanding of the mechanisms involved in addiction and design of new therapeutic appro approaches. She coordinates courses in addiction in doctoral and master programs at the Medical School of Porto. And since 2008, Teresa coordinates a science-based campaign to prevent drug use among high school students. Thank you, Teresa, for accepting this invitation. And last but not least, João Taborda da Gama is a lawyer and founding partner of Gama Gloria, a law firm based in Lisbon. Thank you, João. And advises on the regulation, use, production, and trade of substances in medical, religious, spiritual, and or recreational contexts. Uh, he also advises on all aspects of the cannabis supply chain and is a counsel to organizations advocating for harm reduction and the responsible adult use of cannabis and psychedelics. Uh, he is a regular speaker on narcotics regulations and drug policy around the world and he just published a book uh, called Regulate and Protect Towards a New Drug Policy. João, thank you so much for being here today. Um, unfortunately, our fourth member, Miguel Costa Matos from the Socialist Party and founder of the, uh, and the Secretary General of the Socialist Youth, tested positive for COVID. So to keep us away from that problem, from <laughs> COVID, he didn't come today. Unfortunately, maybe next time we will also discuss uh, with him. Uh, he presented also a, a proposal for the legalization of cannabis and maybe next time we will discuss this with him. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, uh, to participate in this debate. And I would start uh, with you, Carl, because you came from further. <laughs> um, so uh, when I proposed this debate, actually because we were uh, organizing this conference on cannabis, I invited you to participate and you declined my invitation saying no, because talking only about cannabis, uh, it's not right. We need to talk about uh, the other substances. And then uh, just to uh, uh, tell about this uh, little detail, which I think it's important, uh, I totally agreed with you. That's why we opened the debate to all the substances and I think um, it will be more interesting. So, um, what has been your experience um, with drugs in general? Can you tell us more about it? <laughs> yes. Um, I didn't realize you were going to use my words against me. Just so the audience knows, um, I've been studying psychoactive substances since uh, about 1989, so we're talking about 20, about 33 years or so, and I've been studying psychoactive substances in people since about 98. That is, we bring people into the lab and then we give them a variety of substances um, to directly study the effects of drugs like cannabis, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, a wide range of drugs. And so the sort of uh, the major thing that uh, I take away from all of these years' experiences is that drug effects are predictable. Uh, that is, um, uh, once you know dose, the setting, the history of the person, route of administration, all of these things, you can predict drug effects fairly easily. Um, but the way we talk about them in public, some drugs, the way we talk about drugs like heroin, the way we talk about drugs like crack cocaine and some other drugs, we talk about them like their effects are unpredictable as if they are uniquely dangerous. And then we have taken other drugs like cannabis, now the psychedelics, out of the sort of vilified category and made them exceptions. Mm -hmm. While we continue to marginalize, vilify 
people who use those other drugs. Mm -hmm. Without but this community, our community, without saying anything in support of other vilified communities. Mm -hmm. uh, being, <laughs> being a member of, being a black American, uh, a group that is stigmatized in the United States, it's difficult for me to be in any space in life uh, with people who are not standing up on behalf of other vilified people. So I can't do that. And so wherever I go in life, I have to attend to whoever is being vilified so I can be there on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Drugs are not different, and that's my perspective. Uh, and, and so I would just encourage all of us to pay attention to what's happening, what's being said about other drug users, because just like we lied about cannabis for 100 years or so, we're doing the same thing with other drugs. Um, just like we recognize that cannabis has therapeutic potential, although that should not be the standard by which we decide whether a drug is legally available, because one of our favorite drugs, alcohol, would never be <laughs> available. Um, but, uh, but when we think about therapeutic potential, of course, cocaine has therapeutic potential. Opioid drugs have, they're some of the oldest therapeutic potential, uh, had some of the oldest potential, and we, we, we know that. So uh, I implore us not to forget about the lies that were said about cannabis because they're being said about other drugs currently. Mm -hmm. You know, in Portugal, we had this uh, experience in 2001, Portugal, exactly because we had a problem with heroin and uh, HIV, we decriminalized all drugs. And actually, what happened is that um, uh, heroin users, they have support from the state, they have vans that help them to change the, the needles, all these programs that were um, re really amazing to help people uh, with addiction. Uh, but at the same time, is that uh, what I feel is that um, uh, people that used uh, heroin, for instance, uh, they uh, are treated as, as sick people, the people with uh, uh, a special needs and a special support, and I think it's great. But at the same time, the cannabis users today are the drug addicts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you use cannabis, at the end, sometimes you will say, oh, those are the drug addicts. Uh, but to talk about this, I want to ask uh, Teresa, um, what is it? Yeah, sure. Mike has been, oh, okay. Just one thing about the, uh, I, I want to be careful that we, when we talk about various drug uses, like heroin, um, uh, you see people in the public and the media and so forth, the folks who are using heroin in the popular sort of view are the people who are addicted. Yeah. The vast majority of heroin users are like me, not addicted. Like I use yeah. heroin, I use a number of these drugs. And, um, uh, but the image is uh, we conflate drug use with drug addiction. Uh, majority of drug users of any drug are not addicted. And so that's sure. one thing we have to keep in mind. I just want yeah. to make sure that's clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. When I, when I talked about it, that was really people with problems that needed uh, a special support because they were outside on the streets, you know, like not users, but really addicted. So specialized in addiction, Teresa, um, can you tell, tell us more about your research, the research you do with addiction? Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, well, what we do in, in my lab is, as you said, we try to understand better the mechanisms that are acting in the brain. And uh, one of the main questions for us right now is that f I will say that for like 20, at least 20 years, all the research uh, going on, on on addiction was really focused on neurons. It, it, it had a neurocentric view, as if neurons were the only cells in the brain, which of course is not true. They are not even the majority. So now we are really focused on the other cells in the brain. We are trying to understand the role of these cells and how we can um, 
understand the mechanisms uh, regulating mainly the crosstalk between different cells to find uh, new therapeutic approaches. But I would, of course, agree that uh, when we talk about people using drugs or psychoactive substances, we are talking about, um, like, I would say, 10% of people that can, in fact, get addicted to these drugs, and the vast majority won't. And, and this is very important, because in the past, as you said, we changed our law, but uh, we didn't really change the way we look into in people that use these drugs, uh, and we still discriminate them. And, and that is something that I really would like uh, to be able to help changing, which is not easy, <laughs> let me tell you. And if you ask me um, if I agree that all drugs should be uh, regulated in the same way that cannabis is, is probably going to be sooner or later, I would say that in principle, yes, I do agree that uh, an adult that wants to use whatever substances uh, should be able to do that. Uh, I agree with that. But then, if you ask me, okay, and if someone that is uh, deeply depressed is really is going to decide to use this, uh, let's say, cocaine, is he really deciding that in, in a free way? I'm not sure. I don't know. Yes. And uh, then you can also ask, okay, so do you have mechanisms to, to distinguish who is going to be able to use all these drugs or not. And I don't think we have the, the mechanisms that we need to discriminate that in, in uh, a clear way. And you can also ask me, <laughs> is that enough? You make the question. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that enough to, to um, compromise the freedom of all the other, free, the free choice of all the other people that will be able to use these drugs in a, in a more, um, a regulated and safe way? Probably not. So what I mean to say is that I still have some inner questions that I, I, I couldn't yet uh, decide uh, in which way to go. Although in principle, yes, I accept that all drugs should be uh, regulated and, and uh, available for adult use. Yeah. And have, have you studied already the mechanisms of, uh, in the brain of addiction? Why some people get uh, more addicted than others? Well, there are many factors that contribute, but I think that all of us have a, a different pattern of uh, receptors and neurotransmitters. That's why we are not all the same and we think in different ways and we act in different ways and we have different behaviors. And of course, if we have these different pat patterns of receptors and neurotransmitters, then different s substances will have different effects in our brain or slightly different. And some of us will be more um, um, likely to, to become addicted than the others. And some, I would also say that some of us are not at all attracted by experimenting uh, substances mm -hmm. of abuse. So. We are different, and, and that's why. <laughs> also, the drugs are different in their profiles. Some drugs are more addictive than others. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we know that. But, uh, but I, uh, I also agree that with the knowledge that we have now, we can uh, easily preview what is going to happen. Uh, and we can, it's not unpredictable. What is unpredictable, I would say, is, is what may happen with these new psychoactive substances that are getting into the market uh, more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, not maybe in terms of, of effects, but in how to treat and prevent the, the effects of such drugs. But I, if, I, if I can, I think that the really important s step so that we can move towards that regulation for all kind of, of uh, substances will lie on education. We do not educate our young people to live in a world where drugs are present. Mm -hmm. So we pretend that they are not there. And then they are not able to deal and live in a healthy relationship with these drugs. And I think that we really need to implement programs that help them. Um, evaluate risk in a proper way and deal with these drugs in a proper way. Yeah, and, and you are doing already this work with the uh, youth to prevent. I uh, try, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it needed to be much more coordinated across 
all schools and all, all, uh, all the country, which is not. Uh, yeah, not easy to do. João, uh, you just wrote a book, Regulate and, and Protect Towards a New Drug Policy. What would be your uh, ideal scenario of drug regulation as a lawyer? Okay, so uh, I'm a lawyer. You have two specialists here on the brain and on addiction. So I'm just uh, giving a personal view and then what I think can be translated to actionable policy in the midterm. That's my, uh, my, my perspective. Uh, I totally agree with what, what I read um, and uh, that, that substances should have the, at least a similar treatment. I don't know if it's the same or not, but a similar treatment. Uh, and that, of course, the premise is on what that's based. I totally agree on being more libertarian, individual freedom, or as you said, the proportionate measures that you, we cannot forbid something just because a small percentage uh, gets harm or is harmed. We have to protect those, but it's not by prohibiting. When now we know that that prohibition created even more harm mm -hmm. than the harm of the substance itself, and that harm was highly disproportional in terms of global and north and south communities, countries within the countries, gender. So we all know that. That's a fact. So we have to act upon that. It's like a human rights imperative. That's one thing. The second thing that uh, you mentioned is um, is how how with this can we can we do this? So even if we all agree in theory with this, what what's the role of each and every one of us, and how to translate that? into policy. And one thing that uh, strikes me as an example, a real life example, is that when I started working with, with medical cannabis, I had meetings with governments, and one, like eight years ago, which seems like an eternity now, and in one of the first meetings, uh, there was like a mid-level uh, public servant. He listened carefully. He had prepared for the meeting. Uh, and in the end, he said, OK, but my concern is if if we license this facility or this operation, it means that one day we'll be doing this for, and he said, marijuana. Mar so, so he didn't get anything that we was discussing. It was cannabis, it was, and what, what I want to stress is that sometimes our perception on the information on the other side of policy makers, of decision makers, is very, very uh, not, not good. So we don't know what they don't know. Yeah. So we have to assume that they are at level zero, zero, and we have to educate them. So there's education for the youth and for the use of drugs. But in my work, there's a lot of education. In, and it's very easy that people have wrong perceptions. That, that's obvious. But there's a lot of things that they do not know. And, mm -hmm. and they are willing to know if you, if you give them information, if you teach them, if you tell them where to look. They have fear, but once they go beyond the fear, they are able to learn. But the level of knowledge about this is very low because they have other things to take care of. They have other laws to pass. They have uh, COVID to manage. They have things that are easier for them and to get approval from their constituents. So for a number of reasons, ones, ones that are more self-centered than others, it doesn't matter. They have other things in their minds. And therefore, there's uh, all, always a huge step of uh, a uh, learning curve. Well, the learning curve is fast. Uh, we are here, so in my past life I was a tax law professor, so I would be sitting here at the Charters Accountant uh, 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 bar to speak about the budget law. Now we are speaking about drug policy. A few years ago we were speaking about only medical cannabis, then we started introducing uh, other uses, adult use of cannabis, and today we are speaking of other drugs. So change happens fast, so it's also mm -hmm. uh, uh, fast. My main concern uh, my main concern, my doubt, my biggest doubt here is uh, w what s if policy change should be incremental or sudden. Uh, when we decriminalized in 2000, there was discussions, well, I was still at law school, but I reading the, in speaking to people, there was the discussion if it should be for all drugs or not, but that was a minor discussion because as Laura said and, and Teresa has studied, uh, the, the thing was uh, HIV and overdose. Uh, data available was not very good, was not very good, and only after decriminalization data became better, uh, but the decision was made. And although some people argue you should do this by phases, it was all drugs at the same time. So I would call that sudden policy change. No one was expecting it, it changed, the world got better.
the world mm. literally because then we uh, that policy was like uh, translated to other countries mm -hmm. N now when we come to these where there is more knowledge and in portugal in the context of portugal we don't have a huge problem of course there are new psychoactive substances the european drug report came out last week saying that we have one drug new drug per week we have mexican cartels uh, manufacturing amphetamine in Europe, so the, poly, the the landscape is changing in Europe, and that's something to, to watch for. But there is, uh, we don't have the, the high numbers of, of deaths that that in the in the in the US we are we are seeing with fentanyl, and and I know Carl has uh, specific views on that, on and a very uh, very interesting uh, analysis of what counts as overdose and not, and that's something also very. Uh, important to, to share, maybe, but we don't have that. So my doubt is, and I'll finish, is when we broaden the debate about drugs, will we scare the politicians? They say, I can't go to my constituents and say that today's cannabis, but it's also cocaine, is the same. And in, to, and in, my, in my interactions, when I speak to people, the, the question they always make, this is curious and it, it's surprising, it's, it's cocaine, it's not heroin. Because heroin people, I think, that understand uh, that, uh, that it can have a quasi-medical, as also you mentioned in, in, in your book, Carl, of like, people being on that treatment and they, are, they have better lives uh, when they, they are addicted than when with substitutes or with the illicit market, like in, in Switzerland it happens. But for a politician, an, a, a good, willing, average politician, you'd say, I, I can't speak about that. that that's, that's crazy. They say, that's crazy. Even if I agree, it doesn't matter. So how do we, how do we don't pretend that we are only speaking about one substance and include informed arguments about a broader debate without scaring or without scaring people? That uh, it's fear. The, the the main reason is fear for my analysis. So that's my doubt. It's a doubt I have every day. And people ask you that. So does this mean that in two years we'll be sitting here speaking about MDMA? And, and it's a very hard question because if you want to be uh, totally truthful, you have to say, no, we should be speaking about MDMA today. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you say that, you are alienating probably a, a bridge that you have to make incremental policy change. So that's my internal doubt mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I think about it, when I write, and when I, I act on my profession. Yes? Can we respond? Sure. What's up with the mics? <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thank you both. Uh, great comments. Um, I, 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 th I, I want to start with the issue of uh, incrementalism um, a bit. Uh, so <laughs> we all have to understand that um, we each of us don't play the same role. We have different roles and we speak to different people. So, um, so I want to make sure that's clear. Uh, you're talking to politicians. Um, I'm not. Um, I left that a long, a long time ago. Um, I have no faith in politicians. I don't like politicians. Um, sorry if you're Thank here. Thank God the politician uh, is not here today. Oh, uh, <laughs> um, I want to say, uh, yesterday we, we, we had a comment about liberty uh, here. And all of the nations, all of the democratic nations have in their constitution that individuals in their country have this liberty, this right to personal liberty. You have self-determination, uh, you're autonomous, and you have that right. They all say they guarantee that right. Of course, we know that there are problems. We know that. So me as a citizen, me as a responsible citizen, thinking about how we have violated people's liberty simply because they love somebody of the same sex. And so when I think about incrementalism, and we said to those people, for example, you wait, your humanity is not recognized fully yet. Wait until 2020. I think of that as being bullshit. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to ever say that to anyone ever again about their humanity. And so incrementalism, I say, I recognize your humanity right now, your autonomy, your liberty. I will fight for your liberty despite 
it not being palatable to a politician or someone else. I um, would feel horrible if someone told me, and would they have, wait, uh, you know, they don't have experience with your color, your race, so wait until they're ready for your humanity to be acknowledged. That's not right. And, and that's how I feel with drugs, the same way. Um, no, incre no incrementalism for me. Recognize people's humanity right now like your constitution say you do. That's it and for me. And so in terms of convincing people, the people who I try to convince are citizens. The people who vote and I try to explain, try to help them to understand to see people's humanity as their own. Um, and, and, and that's where I try to start. Uh, so when I think about um, uh, this, the issue of uh, uh, cocaine uh, or having some control over people, so like they can't make decisions. Um, clearly, if someone is, has a co-occurring psychiatric illness, we make sure we help them and deal with them. We don't say that comment with alcohol. You know, it's like you're depressed, oh, no alcohol. Uh, 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 we, we may say it, we may say it, but we deal with it as a society uh, because there are people in our society who are depressed, who are schizophrenic, they have a number of issues and we, we deal with it, just like we will deal with it with cocaine, just like we will deal with it with any other drug. And the issue of NPSs in Europe, as I hear the language and I see the hysteria about NPSs, it sounds like the United States, where we talk about fentanyl, and we say the Chinese, the Mexicans, all the people we don't like, they're bringing it in our country. And it's the same thing here with NPSs. Every year you see NPSs go up in, uh, in terms of the numbers that they have uh, gotten from the market. But then when it goes down, no one says anything about that. And then they throw everything into the NPS. It's every sort of new drug, even though you have stimulants, you have uh, opioids, you have a wide range of substances. And so uh, the question for me is, why do you have this cat and mouse game? Cat and mouse game being like, you ban one, now you have a new one. Why do you have that? Rather than stop and looking, it's like opioid users are satisfied with heroin, but you have a number of MPSs because people are trying to circumvent the law. So rather than making available a pharmaceutical grade with no impurities, something that people seek, like heroin, you force the market to do this. So rather than seeing what's happening, and responding rationally, we become more harsh in our uh, sort of penalties. And what we do is we increase even more, we increase the possibility of more MPSs as opposed to being smart about dealing with these substances. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I think that when we're talking about MPSs, we have to talk about why they're there and what's the, what's a smart, response rather than uh, this elevation and uh, people patting themselves on their backs because they have identified all of these new uh, MPS and then frighten them, frightening the public about how dangerous they are because uh, many of these psychoactive substances, uh, like I said, they have predictable effects if you know dose and the rest of these sort of things. And uh, so drugs in themselves, the ones that people seek uh, typically don't have some unique danger. Otherwise, people wouldn't be seeking them in that way. Uh, so in your perspective, Carl, uh, if you could decide, if you were a politician and you could decide what would be the best regulation to all the substances? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, uh, when we think about regulating substances, we don't have to regulate all the substances in the same way. Uh, for example, you might have different requirements uh, in order to access different 
substances. Um, you might have different age requirements. You might have different competence requirements. Like when you drive an automobile, you have to have, you have, to have some competence. You have to pass a test mm -hmm. uh, in order to uh, get access to driving an automobile. So we can, and then we can think about what sort of uh, route of administrations would you have available for various substances. Mm -hmm. uh, the society can think about how they would like to do that. Um, um, there's, uh, so we don't have to uh, do it all in the same way. Uh, the goal, is, and, and by the way, we don't need to uh, legally regulate all of these substances, we only, uh, we can start with a substance from a class. Um, and so like, what is the substance that people are seeking? And then we legally regulate that substance. Mm -hmm. Like for example, if you want to, in the United States, fentanyl is um, uh, available medically. Yeah. Uh, it's been available since the 1960s. Um, uh, and, and we didn't have these problems medically because people know the dose and we even mm -hmm. have it in uh, lollipop formulation for children. Uh, uh, and so uh, children in, 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 with severe pain, of course. Um, uh, the, the point is, is, is that you don't have to like, make fentanyl available recreationally or mm -hmm. uh, for adult use. You can have heroin be mm -hmm. available. That's what people are seeking anyway. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and, and so that's, that's the point. You don't have to make a wide range of these mm -hmm. class, different drugs in these classes available, just the ones that people are seeking. Yeah. What about um, like other drugs that uh, come up every day? I don't know. I see uh, news of new drugs, new substances, and this is for uh, the three of you. How do you see the availability in the illicit markets of drugs that, the new drugs, new formulations, new chemical formulas that appear, uh, I don't know, every day, every month, every year, we hear about new drugs. How can we um, regulate them or integrate them or prevent or at least reduce the risks for those who are taken. Carl, you want to begin? Uh, if we think about uh, the catenones, um, you know, yes. uh, uh, and we can uh, maybe we can look at there's pharmacological evidence and we can see which uh, of the catenones that people are seeking. Uh, you don't have to uh, legally regulate each of those. Um, um, uh, and so when we are saying new drugs are appearing every day, um, uh, these drugs are largely uh, appearing because they, people don't have access to the one that they're seeking. Yeah. Make sure the one that they're seeking is available and that will yes. deal with a lot of these problems. Of course, there will be some person who will continue to try and seek something else, but yeah. that would be an aberration. Yeah. Teresa? I would agree exactly on the same basis. Um, I, I, I don't know if I was not very clear when I first mentioned the NPSs, but I really think also that NPSs are uh, a result from not regulating the other drugs. Mm -hmm. okay, so if you regulate the ones that we know, the classic ones, uh, the number of people seeking the other ones will be, I, I guess, very, very low, and the vast majority will go for those that we know. I have no doubts on that. Okay. So I really think that uh, regulating will make this problem not really disappear, but become so uh, residual that it wouldn't be a problem anymore. Yeah. Yeah. João, uh, uh, do you think with all these new drugs appearing uh, and the approach to the governments, uh, do they want to talk about regulating substances or not? Well, with, with, the, with the new drugs, I think it's, uh, t today it's clear that it's, uh, new substances are, uh, are found and developed because it's a conjunction that people don't have access to the drugs they want, and if you look at the numbers, the, there are like four drugs or four classes of drugs that people seek, and the rest is, is minimal in terms of statistics. Um, and the fact that 
in most countries, we don't have an analogy clause, which means that for you to be incarcerated, governments need to have the explicit substance there. So it's, it, it's a cat and mouse, uh, as Carl was saying, is like uh, ta likes tax planning mm -hmm. in the old days. If it's not written there, let's create it there. Uh, it's, it's principles of criminal law. So it's the conjunction of these two things. Uh, but people, what they want is to change their conscience and feel good or feel less pain or whatever we know that takes people to, to use drugs. And they would use it with substance they know and love, uh, to paraphrase uh, uh, some book. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and they would do it. So it, it's like it's, it's a market-driven, it's, it's a supply-side supply driven more than demand. People don't want something that they don't know they buy online from a lab they don't know where. If they could get something that could get them the same high or the same effect that they would get with something they know. The, the, the problem is that uh, there's uh, this belief that, uh, which is true in terms of criminal law, that you don't go to jail if the substance is not scheduled or listed, which is fun that like in the doping, in the sports doping, it's, it's more general clauses, so those substances are, are cut there, but this is just like academic legal problem, it doesn't matter. The fact is that um, people uh, go to there because they don't find the, into the intoxicant effect they seek, mm -hmm. being it uh, uh, high or low uh, in, the, in the substance that are available, so we should keep the conversation on substances that are known and, uh, and, and try to see what, what is the more convincing uh, requirement to access uh, that, we, that, we can, uh, that we can give uh, uh, people and, and, and a society. Carl was mentioning driving. Yes, and driving is a very good example. I, mm -hmm. I, I use that example sometimes because then you have different classes of vehicles with different requirements for driving. Yeah. You can drive one car at 16 or 18, depending on the country, but if it's a big truck, you have different requirements. If the truck takes more people or if it's a passenger bus, it's different requirements. Sometimes we have to do updates on your, on your skills, on what you are doing. And now with technology, so technology is not only good for uh, drug dealers to sell drugs through Concord or Discord or, or, or Telegram. It's also good to approach people and probably make them refresh their knowledge uh, in many areas, but also on this. So I think uh, that um, uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and once we, 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 we can admit that would, it will not be a one-size-fits-all without fearing of falling into the drug-shaming discourse, which can also be very off-putting if you are trying to, to say that, well, we, we can have different requirements for different substances, and that's normal in a society, different requirements to access to similar professions, to similar activities, uh, and, and therefore we can start, I think that's the way to go uh, to, to that debate. Just one point that uh, listening to what Carl was saying, I, I also, uh, it struck my mind, is that some cultures like in Portugal and like the US, uh, we don't have, uh, it's not very common to have courts making policy change, uh, which means that in a legal culture country like Portugal and most of Europe, citizens don't have that access to policy change, which is going through courts, and Laura knows this with the patients in medical cannabis, mm -hmm. uh, that courts are traditionally very uh, opposed to making themselves the change. It's not like that in Brazil, it's not like that in Canada, it's not like that in Germany, to speak of a, a, port, uh, a European country, of course it's not like that in the US which means that making policy change in a culture and a system like Portugal, like France, like Spain, Italy, uh, you have to in engage uh, uh, the people that, have, that are writing the law. Uh, now in Portugal we have the possibility of having citizens' initiatives to write laws, which is new and it's happening. It, it happened in the right to die, it happened in some areas, so things mm -hmm. are changing. It's not only like a hierarchical top-down approach. Now there are some uh, mm -hmm. ins into the policy changing, uh, but, but also I agree that information is very important. People have to know uh, what they, 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 they are talking about. And, and things that are very obvious to everyone that reads and, and writes about this are not obvious to the people. The, the, the things that Teresa just mentioned, that most of people that use drugs don't have a drug use problem. People don't know that, don't believe that, slash don't want to believe that, then it uh, mm -hmm. makes and you say, but the numbers show this. The UN, the UN shows this. The Portuguese uh, CICAD, which is the 
which is the, the, the body of uh, controlling drug use the, uh, uh, that, that takes the people that are found with, with quantities for personal use, uh, steadily over the years uh, attributes a label that can be discussed, but it's what the law says, that people are dependents or non-dependents, and it's, it's totally the same, it's 90% don't have a drug use problem, 10% have a drug use problem, and th that's the more conservative approach which is made by the system that is uh, in place to apply those laws, to apply those, those laws. So even if then, it, it, is that so that's the numbers we have, but people do not know this. What I want to stress here, we all know this in this room, but people out there, they do not know this, and, and we have to repeat and show and say that we are not lying, uh, and, and then it's probably psychological reasons behind that, uh, drug use being attributed to, to, to minority groups or to uh, contraculture or people have our fear of uh, altering the conscience and what they can mean to themselves. There are various explanations to that. It doesn't matter. We have to deal with that. And even these small um, examples are very, uh, are very, are, are very uh, there. So when we, we haven't discussed here, we, it's also not very rel relevant statistically, but psychedelics um, your average interlocutor in a policy debate believes that people take one acid of LSD and become crazy for the rest of their life, and that happens in 2022 still, even if we have, like, I don't know, five years of intense normalization debate about the use of psychedelics around the world with series, documentaries, uh, mm -hmm. journal articles, investments, so from all the sources, but even people like that, so that's very difficult to change, and that's what people are, are, are thinking. Um, uh, even with cannabis, and, and as Carl mentioned in his previous presentation, psychosis, the myths are there and are very, uh, they have huge stickiness in the public opinion and mm -hmm. in the interlocutors of public opinion, which are uh, policy, policy cha change makers. Uh, one thing I find, uh, I find useful, you asked how, how we have these conversations. Uh, I, I believe that the more normalized the conversations are, uh, the more, uh, the the more normal they are. Well, this is, of course, a tautology, but which means that people understand it's a normal discourse. So yesterday I went on TV speaking about my book and my kids, they never listen to me on TV, but they're on vacation. Now they say, okay, we want to listen. What's your book about? They asked me. And I said, it's about this. And they wanted to read. It's a very small book. And then they, they, they asked me, oh, but, uh, so I have six kids and people of, oh, what do you think if you're, <laughs> take drugs, take cannabis. They asked me, what do you think if you're, and I always say I prefer that they play Bach on the piano and go on hiking and just have a deep loving and meaningful relationship. But then there's our real life. And uh, when there's real life, I prefer they make educated choices and they alter their conscience with the least harmful substance. That's what I say and that's what I really believe. But no one told me this when I was growing up. There, w there was no conversation. But th the thing I want to stress is that w one of my kids, he, uh, he's, um, he's 10, and he said, oh, I think that people take drugs because they find it's funny because it's, it's forbidden. Oh. So the forbidden thing. And yeah. he, he, he went, I never told him about it. We never spoke about that. And he was like, because if it's not forbidden, it was not funny. Funny, that's the word he, he used. And I said, well, maybe, but we have, we have, I told him we have vodka bottles there. In the, in the, near the books, and we are not drinking vodka every time, we just drink when people come. And, yeah. and, and, and I believe that these cultural examples, and Teresa stresses a lot about the culture of a drug and how we know them, uh, um, is useful. And of course, there are many wrongs and things that went wrong with alcohol. We, we know about that, and, and partially is a, a, a domestic violence, uh, car accident. So we know that, mm -hmm. and I'm not minimizing that. <laughs> but but there's a huge normal use of alcohol, huge, yes. huge, like in all households. And it's uh, a big problem. No, At but least the normal in Portugal. Use, but I'm yeah. saying not the, the, like the problem use, the normal yeah. use. We, we look at yeah. the problem use, but there's a lot of normal use. Yes. And we never speak about that because it's not a topic, but we can bring that into the conversation. Mm. So that, that's what I, what I think it's useful. Uh, I think I know there's science behind this, but that's what I, what I, what I found uh, the, the, the more difficult is this asymmetry of information and how to have this conversation, this differentiation of drugs without falling into drum, drug shaming in one place, but not falling also in, in the scare, in the drug scare that our uh, counterpart may have. So that's my, uh, my doubt. I, I also believe that things are, are moving fast and that uh, in, in countries like Portugal, 
uh, it, it helps that Germany is having these discussions, that Portugal is a good example, so we are proud that uh, we are, in general, a good example, so Portugal may want to follow the lead, to, to, to be at, at least in the, the group that's leading uh, change, uh, change in a while, but, but there are things that didn't go right, so n only now we are having, 21 years after, we are having the first safe injection rooms, which is a shame. We don't speak about what went wrong in our drug policy decriminalization, but the fact that we are just having, I think like two years ago, the first safe injection, uh, safe injection rooms uh, fixed, not mm -hmm. mobile uh, mm -hmm. vans, is a shame when other countries yeah. were already having them. So things also go wrong and we have to learn from what went wrong and not repeat that. Yeah. So I will open the debate to, to everyone that wants to make questions. Uh, you want to say I, something, I, Teresa? I sure. Just wanted to add a very short story. Uh, because I, I do these sessions for third year students on the medical school okay. and I do that with a um, clinical psychologist and one of the things that we have agreed in f from the really beginning is that all the clinical cases will be about people that they will identify with so they will read the case and f feel like this could have been me yeah okay and uh, in the first year of the COVID crisis we didn't have that session, it was cancelled, it was just at the start of, of the crisis, so we didn't have it. And the next year, the director of the faculty uh, um, called me saying, I'm terrified, the students that didn't have your session last year, they are now in the fourth year, and they don't have any kind of sim sympathetic attitude towards the, the, um, the, peop the, the, the people that have uh, drug problems, they are only sympathetic towards the families. No. So uh, I think this is really important yeah. uh, to change the way we discriminate is the way we see people. It could have been any of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. for sure. So uh, while you uh, get the microphone, uh, there is one person there that wants to ask a question. I was just uh, wanted to make a final question, Carl. Your book uh, recently published, Drug Use for Grown Ups. Can you just give uh, brief insights on uh, your book for those that don't know it and maybe they can get it after the, conf or the conference? Sure. Uh, I, I recently. Oh. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, no, drug use for grown ups, uh, chasing liberty in the land of fear. Um, it, uh, this was basically uh, the result of 30 some odd years of doing research, traveling around the world, and uh, the question that, that uh, you raise in terms of uh, the statistic that the vast majority of people who use any drug do not become addicted. And so this was, in a way, trying to deal with that as well, using myself. Um, here I uh, take the reader on a tour of my own drug use, of the various classes, of me using drugs around the world with people in government, uh, people in business, uh, people in academia, just a wide range of people, people who are respectable people who you don't know they use because they are in the closet. They are yeah. cowardly about their drug use, and we understand why. But in the book, I implore people to get out of the closet because as long as you stay in the closet, you allow other people who don't have your social capital to be vilified and marginalized. And so uh, I tried to be an example of someone who uses drugs but is productive in society, raises his kids, four kids, uh, and continues to be a university professor, publishes extensively all of these things, but yeah, I use drugs. Um, it's like saying, um, what, the point is, it's like my drug use has nothing to do with my productivity. It's like saying, oh, you have sexual intercourse. So uh, well, you have sexual intercourse in this way, so therefore uh, you can't have that job. It's ridiculous, but that's yeah. what we do with drugs. Yeah. Alfredo. Hello, one, two, three. <laughs> now it's good. Um, thank you for this conversation. I have a question in particular for Carl. Um, it is about whether you think that by legalizing cannabis for adult use and even other relatively socially acceptable drugs such as psychedelics, 
that could mean a lot of harm for users of other drugs, because if we do that without changing the prohibitionist paradigm, paradigm there's a risk of, 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 of solidifying this idea of good drugs versus bad drugs. And let me give you a very concrete example. This was said by the Ministry of Health of Germany, who is now in charge of cannabis legalization for adult use in Germany. And a few months ago, he said, and I'm, and I'm reading his words translated into English, more and more often, the illegally sold street cannabis is being mixed with a new type of heroin that can be smoked. This quickly drives cannabis users into a heroin addiction. So I think here we have a very good example of a country that is trying to be progressive by legalizing cannabis for adult use, yet the Minister of Health, who is also a physician and a professor of public health, is saying this factually incorrect statement that continues to solidify this idea of yeah. there's good drugs and bad drugs. What's your opinion about that? Um, my opinion is that you're being very kind when you describe him as <laughs> being factually incorrect. Um, I was thinking more on the lines of an idiot, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I wrote uh, my chapter on, on psychedelics in, in, in this book, uh, deals with this very issue. Uh, Mike, I raised concern about the writers who are writing positively about psychedelics on the one hand while besmirching or uh, vilifying another class of drug on the other hand. Um, uh, I think about in the United States, it may, not has, it may not have come here yet, but in the United States, the media coverage, the television programs, the movies, are a lot more positive about psychedelics and they continue to be harsh about other drugs. And so I've been writing about those things, I've been lecturing about those things in, in hopes of people, uh, that people would see the hypocrisy, the inconsistency, uh, and would be embarrassed to do that sort of thing. But the statement that you read uh, from this German health minister illustrates that um, people are not embarrassed by such stupidity. Uh, and so um, uh, I, I guess the, the only thing we can do is try to help the public and people to understand uh, uh, these inconsistencies and that these drugs are, um, uh, they are psychoactive substances. And um, there are ways to make sure we enhance their safety while minimizing uh, potential problems. Yeah. Uh, one question over there and one here. Please Hi. keep it brief because we have yeah, 10 minutes. Not like yesterday, no problem. Uh, I, w I wonder to Carl, like, what are those requirements will be like? Like, uh, we cannot we cannot hear you very well. Uh, sorry, like going further into this discussion, like understanding what the requirements would be like, because this is like a fundamental point. Now uh, you need to approach the microphone to your. Mom. Can you hear me now? Yes, please. No. Uh, well, my question is further in this discussion, what will be the requirements be like? Uh, more precisely, like, will the requirements be into the psychological and the morphological realm? Uh, will that be added and should be preferably be had uh, training like we have for guns or for driving? And can you please give yeah. us an example? Uh, just quickly. Um uh, yeah, you might have to have, let's say, a, a license to buy an opioid, and a license saying that you have some understanding about, I don't know, the, the uh, physical dependency producing uh, effect, and you might, and you know how to identify uh, symptoms of constipation, uh, the, which is a huge uh, issue. Uh, the, you may have to, uh, I haven't really thought about the specifics, uh, uh, because uh, I think that there are a number of smart people who we can work this out and decide. Uh, 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 that's one of the things that I want to be careful about. I don't want to 
play every position. I, I want to play the position that um, I have an expert expertise in, and I do in pharmacology, and, that, and so I can think about what would be appropriate, but then other people also should have some input, so uh, we make the best decision as a society. And you might have differing age, can, uh, age requirements. For example, in the U.S., uh, I think uh, with tobacco, you can purchase tobacco at 18 years old. With alcohol, it's 21. I mean, we may have some issues with that, but the, it shows some flexibility that we've already exercised. There is another one. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll try to be brief. We have to go to lunch. So uh, first and foremost, thank you, Laura and, and Fernando, for organizing this amazing conference. Thank you. Uh, my question was going to be to Miguel, but unfortunately he's not here. Uh, but I think João can also help me understand a little bit more of, of uh, the questions that I have for the future and just trying to narrow down a little bit more the conversation to Portugal and to cannabis. Uh, obviously, looking back to the progress we've been having over the years with medicinal cannabis, we had the legalization in 2018. We also had the proposal from uh, Bloco de Esquerda for uh, adult use in Portugal, which was voted against by the Socialist Party and the Social Democrat uh, Party. Uh, last year, uh, interestingly enough, we had another proposal from uh, Bloco de Esquerda and also from uh, Iniciativa Liberal uh, for the regulation of this adult use uh, in Portugal, which, uh, interestingly enough, was not voted against uh, uh, the Socialist Party and the Social uh, Democrat Party. Uh, instead, there was uh, a technical discussion uh, and not a vote precisely on that day that we, it was presented to the parliament. Uh, then we had another problem because then the government fell, uh, but now we have a Socialist Party back uh, uh, in charge. So, João, my, my question would be, from your uh, uh, personal point of view, uh, how do you see uh, this drug policy around uh, recreational cannabis happen happening here in Portugal for the future? Uh, what do you think we can all do as companies, patients, uh, uh, all of the stakeholders across the industry? What can we do uh, to help push that forward as well? Um, especially because we are also seeing uh, all of the, the uh, 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 movements across Europe already happening. So I, I think it will also be a matter of time until Portugal uh, also follows with that. So I would just like to understand a little bit more of your perspective on that work. Okay, uh, thank you for, for, for the question. Um, the context, uh, in my opinion, uh, has these three main uh, points. So we have the most uh, pro-cannabis parliament that we've ever had in Portugal. We have four political parties that elected members of parliament which had cannabis adult use on their running programs to parliament. Iniciativa Liberal, Livre, uh, Bloc de Esquerda and PAN. Four, and they four elected uh, members of parliament. The two most opposing cannabis uh, parties in the parliament uh, were either vanished, CDS, or wiped down in their representation, which is the Communist Party, very against uh, cannabis liberalization. And the fourth uh, good news is that we have the far right uh, in the parliament, and the far right is totally opposed to cannabis. So it's very good that we'll make other parties unite against the far right. So with this, we have a socialist majority. The PS was a party that uh, was responsible for the decriminalization in 2000. Um, uh, Antonio Costa, the prime minister, was part of that government. Uh, the prime minister, Antonio Guterres, is now the secretary general of the United Nations. So I think it's a good alignment that policy change can be made again. The opposition party, the Social Democrats, they have, they have uh, many MPs that are explicitly pro-cannabis regulation. One of them has introduced a a project in their own Congress that was approved that uh, cannabis should re be regulated, which means that on a parliament level, and this change has, has to be done uh, through parliament because it, in, because of many reasons, but a uh, formal one, it involves, um, it involves crimes and therefore it should be made uh, in parliament. Uh, the parliament is, uh, is, I think it's ready to discuss that and we'll, we'll discuss that uh, soon. I don't know the result, of course, but it will have for the first time a, seri a serious discussion on cannabis uh, policy in the next month. So that's the, the context. All bills in Portugal must be signed by the president. We have a conservative president. That's something to, to keep in mind. 
but that's one part of the, the answer to the question. The context of what's happening in Europe, it's fa favorable, uh, mainly due to German. Uh, Germany, what's happening in Germany, being a socialist, the socialists also being in the coalition in Germany, uh, our socialist party is very connected to the German socialist party for historical reasons and for personal reasons. So I believe also that's uh, a sign of hope for cannabis uh, uh, regulation and the fact that such an economy and country uh, like is German, uh, we know from the from the uh, the Troika years that uh, Portuguese like to follow what the Germans uh, do and uh, sometimes dictate. So uh, in this case, it will be good for, for everyone <laughs> that lives in cannabis change policy. Uh, and, and so this is the, this is the, the context. Uh, uh, I believe my personal opinion, and I've said this many times, I believe that uh, medical cannabis companies should uh, stay uh, with medical cannabis uh, business and should not interfere with uh, non-medical cannabis. That's what they are authorized for. That's what Informed has authorized them for. That should be their line of business. When policy changes, if laws changes, they should, of course, uh, position themselves as they will or not, as they want or not, in terms of their business models to other cannabis use that are allowed. But companies should uh, only do what is allowed, at, a, of course, at a certain point in time. And that's my... Uh, my, my advice, which I thought of a, li a, a, a lot, and I think that's the wisest thing that uh, companies should do. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that uh, across the board, and that's detrimental to policy change. I should uh, let that be very clear. Um, then there's this third question that's related to this one, which is how the supply chain uh, of legalized cannabis is going to be uh, in Europe and in the world. And that's a question of efficiency, of price. Uh, that creates uh, other problems. Uh, and we can, we, we have, I, I'll go to that in, in the end. Um, but I believe that Europe uh, should have a conversation in the countries that are more ahead in legalizing adult use cannabis and create an efficient supply chain. And in that context, Portugal, uh, with, with installed capacity of medical grade cannabis, uh, will be uh, and should be, in my opinion, a relevant, uh, relevant player for all reasons, not only because it would be good for national economy, but also for more wider uh, arguments like uh, environmental, environmental uh, issues. It's uh, more environmental friendly to grow a plant in the south of Portugal than in the north of Holland for, uh, or in the north of Germany for reasons that are very obvious to, to everyone, but I believe there will be production in any side. And then the fourth question, uh, which is a, a debate that we are not used to in Portugal, but uh, Carl uh, has touched on this and many people have written about it and, and, and Laura in their uh, activism always are pointing out to this, but it's not very common, is what we do in terms of social justice uh, when, we, uh, when legalization comes. I also believe it will come. It can be one year, two years, but it will come. And one, what we do in terms of social justice, that's not a very common type of discussion we have in Portugal. Uh, we tend to believe uh, in a semantic fallacy that everything is very beautiful and goes very well in Portugal. We don't have injustice. We don't have racism. That's the pervasive narrative, which of course it's, it's wrong and it's detrimental. But we have to think of what to do uh, in terms of social justice. And and, and this means uh, self-cultivation, allowing or not, which would mean maybe uh, a means, an economic means to people that were in the context of illicit trade. And there are other reasons, but now I'm concerning with this. And this is not a very easy conversation to have, but if you have small dealers and something becomes le legalized, they are losing their income. And this is very counterintuitive. This is not something that no one wants to go live discussing this, but you have to address these problems. What yeah. are you doing with communities that were affected with, uh, with, with, with cannabis trade? Uh, maybe we don't have problems uh, like other countries because we have decriminalized 20 years ago. So we don't have today our jails full of young kids from poor neighborhoods or uh, uh, from uh, uh, blacks or whatever. And then there's a problem in Portugal that we don't know uh, the number of uh, uh, we don't know the, 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 the race profile of the country because there's this interpretation that that would be unconstitutional, which of course just increments racism, but that's a different conversation. But uh, we know that these people are especially affected. So I was looking at my Instagram coming 
coming here uh, now, and, and Gulbenkian, the largest cultural foundation, they did a very, a very uh, nice program with having kids, kids or youth from, from prisons dancing and in opera, and that was like I was seeing the Instagram story, and half of the kids were blacks. And, and of course, that's, uh, it, it, it's a, a huge disproportionate representation of incarcerated people that we have in Portugal. Uh, in general. We don't have drug use crimes as per se because it was decriminalized in 2000, but we have adjacent crimes, small traffic, uh, judges that, uh, that say that's not for personal use and put the kid uh, in jail. And then we have problems with, with foreign women. 70% uh, of the foreign women that are incarcerated in Portugal have no connection with Portugal and they were uh, uh, being, bringing uh, they were carrying drugs. I don't know the, the name. Uh, the name in English, uh, and, and so it's a huge disproportion of of incarcerated populations that we have in Portugal. And we have to, of course, expunge, clean the, mm -hmm. the criminal records, the past criminal records. But we have to also look at these fringes of uh, not personal use, uh, but not the big dealer. And these communities, we we have these problems, and we have to look at that. From what I know of Portugal, this will not be written in the law as such. We are, so we have some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, a state hypocrisy. Uh, but, but we have to do our best that no one forgets about this, uh, even if they don't write it on the law. And this social justice discussion in Portugal is really difficult from my perspective and from my experience, is really difficult to have. And to begin with is that people don't want to believe there's a problem of injustice in Portugal. That's very peculiar to Portugal, maybe in other jurisdictions, but, but we have that. So that conversation also needs to be, to be, to be tended and to have in the context of legalization. Uh, um, but, but, but I don't know how to do, uh, I don't know how to do that. Uh, I don't know what that means. I think self-cultivation would, would allow for some, some part of that. Uh, I believe a not very strict uh, regime of licensing of shops would allow more people to, to, to open their own shops in their own neighborhoods. I think that um, uh, even programs of, uh, uh, related, to, to, to related to the criminal justice system in a good sense uh, that would bring back people that know about drugs to work with drugs and to teach about drugs and do that openly that, that probably could speed up some, uh, some of the efforts and, and some of the justice. Uh, and, 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 and that would, in my opinion, should be made uh, with the specific taxes that cannabis uh, will, will have. Uh, cannabis, um, uh, so, so a huge discussion around the world, if you have more a critical point of view in terms of cannabis legalization, is that you are creating a market for big corporations. And that will bring the price down, the price per gram, uh, and, and so uh, that, that was even uh, the paper you published, some of the com comments were on that, on, on some, some authors in academia. I believe that from what I know, and maybe because of my background, a way to deal with that with, is with an excise tax, and excise tax should try to place uh, the price per gram in terms that's not so cheap that, that, that access expands to, to populations that we don't want to, and I'm saying young people. Mm -hmm. uh, and but at the same time doesn't leave the illicit market uh, as is. Mm -hmm. So and an excise tax probably can do that. And and then but what I want to now to 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 come to is we should use part of that money and even other money from other taxes uh, to to reinvest in in this not also in education as Teresa is always mentioning, but also to reinvest in these in these communities. Uh, but in Portugal, it's not like in the US, like we've seen the discussion in New York or New Jersey, where these communities are organized, they come forward, they put their agendas. Uh, so there's also, uh, it, it's also more difficult to identify and to see where, where to, to, to apply the money. But I think that that should be done and that discussion is doing. And I know that the NGOs that work, are working on this have this very present in their minds. But I think it's only a small minority that is aware that, that this is also a problem that we have to address. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, thank you for this great talk. Um, I have a bit of a niche with the term adult use. Uh, because it reminds me to pornography first, and then because <laughs> 
we're leaving out uh, a, a big part of users. There are minors, probably from 16 years old until whatever age is adult in each country. So here will be 18, maybe in the States, maybe 21. And I think it's a big group of people that is critical because they are growing and it's a critical age. And what, what happens in the States with these kids that want to buy and cannot access? They will not be able to access information about it because they will be banned probably from the shops or the dispensaries. Uh, so how can we deal with this? Because I think it's a bit, a bit hypocritical to you know, sustain the adult use of cannabis when it's legalized. So what about the kids? Will they be criminalized? Will they have, uh, what will happen with them legally? Uh, how do we deal then with these kids that will start using before they are adults? Just a quick note to say, no, that the, the, the last bill presented to the Portuguese parliament actually uh, two weeks ago, it uh, doesn't say adult use anymore, it says personal use. So I think the, the, they are also changing that, but please. Yeah, there are a number of issues with the, that adult use uh, nomenclature. But uh, well, you the, the, your question is really addressing a really really important issue, and I think that most of us are aware of of their problem. Um, it's often we listen to the question if we are going to push the illicit market market into the adolescents because they will be uh, left out of, of um, the, the regulated market. And I, I, I'm with you, this is a problem, and I don't know if Joan has any good uh, <laughs> answer for that. I don't, and that's something that um, worries me a lot. Uh, and other than education and uh, other uh, other options <laughs> for for those young kids. Um, I don't know if we are going to be able to protect them um, from this illicit market that is probably going to to focus on them, and that that is a fear that I have. Uh, I don't know if Joe, if you want to add something to that. Just very, very quickly, so I think that uh, adult use, it's a strategic coined term and narrative to, to try to have a more efficient approval of laws and to deal with the scare of people. It's semantics, it's, it's narrative, it's part of a narrative. I don't know who coined it, but I, 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 for me that's a very obvious. I think we, with every good intended person in this debate, what will never admit but once is that it happens with the same is of alcohol. We don't want kids to consume alcohol, but if they do, we want them to consume alcohol. That's even if they cannot buy it, but that's manufactured and sold at a store with all the quality approvals and it does not have methanol or ethanol and it's not made in a garage. So it, it, we, we admit that spillover from the legal uh, sales can uh, can go to the youth because we prefer them, we would prefer them to be consuming that kind of cannabis rather than cannabis that's uh, probably laced with synthetic cannabinoids or that they don't know what they are consuming or whatever. So uh, I believe, so, so answering your question, I think it's, it's semantics, but every everyone what wants is that the supply of a quality produce is greater than the supply of something that's uncontrolled, a little bit like what happens with alcohol. In terms of age, uh, I think it was Teresa that I learned this with Teresa in terms of age. Uh, Carlos also saying that we have different requirements in age. Uh, if science was to, 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 put, to write the rules, uh, I, I even heard once someone explaining to me that it even should be different based on your body size, even on gender. Uh, relating to the quantity of water that you have in your neurons and in your brains, but 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 it will never be like that. So we have to have. Nor should it. Nor should it. No. <laughs> nor should it. No, not like that. No. Okay. So it's maybe I read. So, but but there there has to be a cut a, a cut off day a cut off age uh, a cut off age. But you are true. It's 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 quite uh, it's inquir inquirent that we're saying uh, we we want kids. Uh, to, to be safer and saying, well, but they cannot access the, the safe stuff. It's true, it's obvious. And I think uh, semantics don't matter. Semantic 
matter for us. There are, we, we are trying to inform, educate. So for me, it's very important, the semantics. And I don't want to pass the wrong idea I feel is wrong because I feel we are just, you know, keeping on the hypocrisy of not, of not legalizing and not giving access to the kids that will use it. It will be forbidden for them, so they will want to use it more. And maybe in the States you have the example already that, you know, they ask friends that are older to buy for them and probably they will buy larger quantities and they will use it as soon as they can because they cannot take it home. So I don't know, how does it work in the States with the kids? Uh, how does how does cannabis work with with the kids? With, yeah, sure. uh, uh, I, I, the kids use in places like uh, uh, they've done a number of surveys in places like Colorado uh, to see if kids use uh, increase as a result of uh, legal regulations, and there there hasn't been an increase. I I I I I, I don't um, and I, I think about. Alcohol exa example. I mean, it's. Uh, I think about driving. We have made these distinctions for children. Like we don't allow people to drive legally without being a certain age. It, what else can you do? Maybe you have a suggestion. I. I, I don't know what else a society can do. It, um, obviously, uh, in a place like Colorado, for example, one of the things that they they're still doing that's problematic is that they're still arresting kids for cannabis in some cases and and that's a concern and you don't want that like was pointed out nicely uh, so that's the major con we don't want to be overly punitive to those kids who might violate this law but uh, you we have distinctions for children in our society uh, and I don't see this as being any different. Uh, maybe you, 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 you. Maybe lowering the age instead of Sure. Or, I, I, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, when, I, no, I, I agree. I, I mean, in the U.S., for example, I was in the military at 17 and given an M16 so I could kill and be killed, but I couldn't drink alcohol. So that yeah. doesn't make any sense. And so maybe we should, yeah, absolutely reconsider the age. We should be thinking about all of these things. If you are old enough to be sent into battle, maybe you can have a joint too. <laughs> Margarita is a journalist. That's why she is concerned about semantics. Um, thank you all. We overpassed the time of this round table. And I want to thank you for this uh, interesting debate. And thank you all for being present. Let me just, uh, Carla, I think she has some words to say. Few words. <laughs> and the first words are going to call the PTMC staff that is on the room to join this stage so that I believe we will all take the advantage of this amazing panel and applaud them after two days all of recognizing. All the recognized team that made this possible, please come here. This is the reason why all of this happened in such a professional way with knowledge brought to us worldwide with wonderful <laughs> discussions, great speakers, and a really good audience, even if, as Laura said, Sorry. less is more, but passionate people about this kind of theme. So I don't know if we have all of them here, I guess so. I will ask for all speakers and all the staff that made this possible, Laura and Fernando, on for, as partners in crime, as you said. Yes, we are. So a huge round of applause, <laughs> and thank you so much for your presence in this Congress. Thank you. And someone was, uh, someone was asking about the socks, the cannabis socks going around. <laughs> And we want to, to thank Daniela from Insana Floor that, that brought some chocolates and some cannabis socks for, to our speakers. And we want to thank Elena from Empology that brought uh, amazing empty. And Kanajin that provided gin for uh, everyone here. You will receive yours, don't worry. <laughs> and um, thank you all. And I hope we see you in October. You want to see, say something?
Yeah, the, uh, cakes. the cakes of Louise from Six Sentidos, Six Senses, Six Sentidos. Thank you so much, Louise, for the little cookies that were cannabis free this time. Thank you. Thank you. What, you must what have am enjoyed I enjoyed it because it's still there. <laughs>